what would it take for you to move to Miami with me? And he was like, well, in order for me to get my parents on board, I would need a base salary so that they would feel comfortable knowing I'm good. I'm just so competitive. And I think that's probably even more advantageous than just being a hard worker. I'm so competitive and I hate losing so much that it like literally drives me insane. I think it is probably the most important skill. Um, I don't really know if I had to like try to make an argument of something else. I don't know what I would say. Alex, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. It's a pleasure to finally meet you in yeah. person. A Miami fellow Miamian, absolutely crushing it, bro. I see you online yeah. all over the place. Thanks for coming on the show, dude. Yeah, thank you. This setup's awesome. Dude, Love thank it. you. First time using uh, the in-home setup here. Uh, got my iPad over there, screen yeah. mirroring without turning off on the projector. Um, Love it. And using my parents' uh, movie theater room. So you know what? You got to do what you got to do here, right? Yeah, I love it. Well, I like to get right into things. Let's start with the first question I had for you. Mm -hmm. You built your first successful company in college while playing D1 tennis. Yep. How much ha was an a being an athlete, how much did being an athlete affect and play into the successful person you are now? I think a lot. Um, you know, I was just a very very hard worker from the start and I was also just I'm just so competitive and I think that's probably even more advantageous than just being a hard worker I'm so competitive and I hate losing so much that it like literally drives me insane and so as I like transitioned out of playing tennis because obviously I ended up leaving school business just became like that new itch in my brain that I had a scratch and I was like it just became my my new game that I play and I was like I have to win at this and obviously winning in big in business is like an ambiguous thing um and you know you're never going to be like number one necessarily but um yeah I mean, i'm just so competitive that like if i see you know a competitor doing better than me and i'm like how are they doing better like you know what i mean i'm like i i think that i could do i could market this way better than them or you know i could build a better product than them and so it just drives me crazy that there's like someone out there that is like ahead that i think that i could beat um, and so that's kind of like what drives me now. Yeah, I, I just love asking that question to anybody who I know played sports and is now in business because the response is always the same, but I still enjoy having the conversation mm -hmm. because it is all about competition. I mean, yeah. business, I mean, it's you versus the other person. You're never the yeah. only one. I mean, you might be the only one in a new market for a little bit, but you're never by yourself. So it's always coming down to who's going to be more competitive. Yeah. And I think sports really gives people that edge because- you grow up your whole life and you're just competing from a young age, like yeah. from 10 years old to 20, it's like every weekend it's competition yep. and you know, your parents are involved. Everybody wants to see you win. It builds like a different person than people who didn't play sports and yeah. not that people who didn't play sports can't be successful in business. Right. But I am a firm believer that if you did play sports, you do have an edge when it comes to just the competitive factor yeah. of going head to head against somebody else in a business. And I think, I think being very personable and social is a huge plus when you're in business. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that comes from sports as well. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, you're 12 years old, you're playing with people you don't really know. You're learning about other people's environments. You're getting out of your little personal bubble. Yeah. And I think that really plays a big part into the type of person you become when you're older, mm -hmm. because there's plenty of people that I knew that played sports. I mean, that didn't play sports that were stuck in this little bubble of the same yeah. people their whole life. And I was like, dude, I met hundreds of kids right. from all over the world from all different places. So I think that's just a great, I wanted to start with that question right off the bat because yeah. I think it's super powerful. Yeah, I totally agree. You came up through online sales. Yep. I'm in sales as well. I think sales is amazing. I think anybody listening should dive in, challenge yourself, get in uncomfortable conversations. It'll make you a much better person. What are your thoughts on is sales the most important, not tool, sales, is sales the most important um, skill you can learn as an entrepreneur or are there other ones that you think are more important? I think it is probably the most important skill. Um, I don't really know if I had to like try to make an argument of something else. I don't know what I would say just because, because sales is not even a skill to learn only if you're a business owner. It's like, even if you're, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you should be learning sales because whether you're trying to ask for a pay raise that's sales, like, you know, building relationships, whether it's like a business relationship or like, you know, with a girl or, or like any, ro you know, romantic relationship, like that's, that's sales in a way. Um, and you know, it also translate, translates into like copywriting, like your ability to write. So like, not just like 
verbal sales or like in person or over the phone. But I also think copywriting is super important to learn because your emails on your funnels, like it's, it's everywhere. And so, yeah, I definitely think sales is probably one of the best things that you can learn um, because it's going to help you in quite literally every aspect of your life. Yeah. I love, I love the quote, like everything is a sale, <laughs> like literally right. everything. So if you can learn that skill, you can really insert yourself in almost any conversation and be successful. And I think that's where a lot of people that are in sales have an advantage. Mm -hmm. You can get into a conversation quickly because in sales, you got to be always thinking on your feet. You never yeah. know what the other person on the other line. I, You know what? I think it's funny. I like to attest sales to like a cornerback in football. Mm -hmm. You're playing against the most, you're going against the most athletic guy on the other side of the ball. Yeah. And you have no clue what he's about to do. You have to be on your feet, moving left to right. And I think that's how sales is. You have to be able to navigate a conversation, deal with objectives, mm -hmm. quickly get up to speed on what people are talking about. Yeah. And I think that's why like sales is such an important skill because I mean, people in our fields, we go and I mean, we just met 15, 20 minutes ago yeah. and now we're here and we're having a face-to-face in-depth yeah. conversation. If I wasn't somewhat of a salesperson or an outgoing individual, it would be hard for me to come on here and just right. start chatting. Absolutely. And I think that that's why, that's why I think sales is the most important thing and something that anybody can learn. Oh yeah. I hate people that are like, oh, I'm not a salesperson. Anybody can build confidence and go out there. Like, I guess this is a good question for you. You've worked with so many people. How many people have come to you who were not great when you first had a conversation and are now a killer in sales? Yeah, a ton. And I do think there's some like, uh, myths around sales because it just gets such a bad rap, right? Because when, when you say sales, people automatically think to the used car salesman that's <laughs> like using some sort of sleazy tactic. And that's obviously not the case. Like when I'm talking about everyone should learn sales, I'm not talking about you should be learning how to, everyone should learn how to close deals and you should be like, oh, I need to close this deal and I need to like fake money and I need to handle objections. I just mean learning about like, it's a lot of it is like even hum, human psychology, right? Like, yeah, no, and, and I mean, I just couldn't agree with you more on that the way that you carry yourself is probably the most important thing that you can do. Keep Absolutely. your shoulders back, come into a room with confidence. And you know, imposter syndrome is normal. Anybody listening, sure. like, you're super successful. I'm hoping that I will be successful soon with this podcast. And I've just met tons of successful people like you and everybody has imposter syndrome. Like everybody's yeah. worried. Everybody's nervous. The person you're talking to is nervous to talk to you too. Right. So like go in there and just be confident and know your value, know your worth. And then you will start to see that you will get in these conversations and you'll surprise yourself. Like I've had yeah. conversations where I'm like, I end the call and I'm like, damn, like I just crushed that. Yeah. And it wasn't because I was nervous or freaking out. It was because I went in and I'm like, I know I'm good at this. Right. I'm going to do this conversation to the best of my ability. And then you start to see the results and it's like, shit, you know, I'm actually pretty good. Um, the other question I had, you moved to Miami from Ohio, mm -hmm. Closeify, which we're going to get more into was, I guess we could say your big first big win. Mm -hmm. You doubled Closeify's revenue in the first month. Yeah. How much of leaving your hometown and your comfort zone can you attest that success to? Yeah, it was a lot. So basically I didn't want to move alone. And so one of my good buddies that I went to high school with that was doing sales for Closeify, I was like, what would it take for you to move to Miami with me? And he was like, well, in order for me to get my parents on board, I would need a base salary so that they would feel comfortable knowing I'm good. And I was like, okay, um, like deal. Um, and so I, by putting him on salary that, you know, doubled the business's expenses, maybe, maybe more. I also don't even remember. And then moving to Miami from obviously living at home, I went from basically no expenses to Miami expenses. Miami expenses. Um, <laughs> And so now keep in mind, I had like runway in my bank account because I had been making money in the past, I don't know, like a little over a year and again with no expense. So I had money. It wasn't like I'm moving to Miami and like, oh, if I don't make money, I'm like not paying rent next month. But still, I was like, I want to be able to afford to live in Miami in a decent way yep. and not to like, um, like I don't live a crazy lifestyle, but like just to like, you know, if I want to go out to dinner, not have to, have to worry about it, like yep. little things like that. Um, and so when I got here and I got in this environment of all these guys that are killing it and seeing all the wealth that was around me, I mean, it was definitely a factor in, in growing the business. 
Yeah, I mean, Miami's a different animal. And, like, yeah. I tell everybody that. I tell anybody who's online who I'm interviewing, Miami's a different animal. Yeah. Like, if you want to come into a place where you're going to be motivated immediately because you're going to have trouble sleeping because 10 people are revving their Ferraris, <laughs> Lambos, and all these sports cars, like, yeah. that's the type of environment here. And what was it like to be 20, 21, 22, and put one of your good friends on salary? Like, dude, that's that's badass. Like, how did that yeah. feel? It was cool. It was definitely a cool feeling. Um, I mean, again, it was just like we started off like doing sales together during the like the you know what. Yep. Um, when we both got kicked out of college to like go home. Yep. Um, so to like kind of go from like two kids that were making like a little bit of money to like building a startup in Miami, it was definitely really really cool and rewarding feeling. I mean, dude, that, that that's awesome. Like someone who's been here from Miami, like. Hearing a story like that gets me so fired up because yeah. I've always been bullish on this city. I think it's the best place in the world. Yeah. Maybe not the best place in the world because I've traveled to some amazing places in Europe, but I think in the States, there's no better state to be right now. And I continue to meet people like you that prove that mm -hmm. and like are coming here for a reason. So uh, I think it's cool. And I mean, that's such a, that's such a huge accomplishment, like yeah. to be able to do something like that for somebody, you know, at such a young age and so much responsibility too. Yeah. Like, what 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 did you study in college? Because I mean, you're running a full business here. It's not it's yeah. not like you're doing basic addition and subtraction. You've got yeah. taxes. You've got responsibilities. Like, what did you study, and how much of that carried over? <laughs> so I was studying finance. Um, so That's my good. my dad did finance, and then my dad worked for Chase. My brother studied finance. Now my brother works for Chase. Okay. I was kind of going down the same path, and I just realized I wouldn't like it. Um, to be honest, none of it transferred. <laughs> okay. Uh, I didn't, but I didn't get deep into like the actual finance classes like yeah. I, the school i went to like the first two years is like the what do they call them like the general the prereqs yeah like stuff like that so i didn't get into too many like finance that you know deep related classes so nothing really carried over um i probably should have paid more attention in the accounting class <laughs> um but yeah nothing really transferred over good thing you can hire people for that yeah and like while yeah. we're on the school topic i think it's funny you mentioned on one of the podcasts you did a six-page paper in high school yeah. And it was supposed to be on an unpopular opinion and you were yep. going to college. Yeah. Now that you've gone to college, dropped out of college. Yeah. What would you say to anybody here listening? Because I, I think college is, is great, but I'm also on the boat that we yeah. have so much free education. You can make it w without it. What are your thoughts on college now? Should everybody be looking to mm -hmm. be an entrepreneur or should everybody be very selective on what they're doing? Yeah, it's such an interesting question, and it's so hard to answer because there's obviously no like blanket answer. Yeah. Um, I wrote that paper like fully, fully anti college. That's because it was supposed to, <laughs> it was supposed to be like an yeah, um, unpopular opinion. But it was actually what I do remember is like, I just remember being absolutely like stunned once I started looking at the evidence of how crazy it is that some people go into how much debt. Like, I didn't know the stats behind it, and I don't remember them exactly now, but I think the average person doesn't pay off. The person that takes on college debt, they don't pay it off till like, 35-ish, maybe. And I would say that that might be early. Like, it, it was it's, it's bad. And I was, like, I was blown away. And so I was, like, looking at the stats, and I was, like, so they're paying X amount of money to make X amount of money. So it was, like, it was like you know, the average was, say, maybe $100,000. I don't even know. It's, it's so expensive. But say they pay $100,000 to get a job that a lot of my friends that just graduated in Ohio, it's like 40 to like 55 a year. You're not paying back that hundred really quickly like that. In Ohio, like that's fine. And then I'm thinking about it. And then I look at this biggest stat was like of how many people enjoy their job. And it was so low. So, <laughs> so, so I'm like, you're going in debt to get a job, to pay back the debt for a job you don't enjoy. Like when I put all that together, I was just like, wow. And that was when I started, I was like, am I going to enjoy finance? But to answer the overarching question, obviously not everyone can be entrepreneurs. Yeah. The, the world wouldn't run. Um, and if your school is paid for, I don't really think there's a reason not, not to go. Yeah. Like college is fun. Yeah. Like the only, I would have, I would have graduated if again, you know what didn't happen. Cause yeah. like it's stripped away the social aspect of school. Mm -hmm. um, but like if your school is paid for, I would go, I would have fun. I would make friends. I would have like experiences like, Absolutely. Um, if you're going to go into a lot of debt, I think 
it might not be the best route. Um, you know, I think there's just so much opportunity and free online education. Like you said, um, I probably wouldn't encourage someone to take on that much debt, especially, especially if they're not going to be like really passionate about what they're going to do. Um, but yeah, I think it's a very interesting question to debate. Yeah. I think I, I, unfortunately, I feel like our generation is going to be the ones that are affected as this rolls out because I know plenty of people. I mean, like I said, I'm still here in my hometown. Luckily, it was Miami. Yeah. Um, so I know hundreds of people and I know them. I know how much money a lot of them took out to go to certain schools. Yeah. I am very curious to see what the 20 year effects are here because yeah. I have friends that are. And, and look, if you're going to go specialize in something like if you're going to go $150,000 in debt and go be a lawyer and you're going to make $350,000 right. a year. Good. Yeah, that, that, that's calculated and makes sense. Absolutely. If you're going to go and pull out a $150,000 loan to get an art degree, no offense to anybody who likes yeah. art, and then go teach high school. Right. I mean, dude, where's that money going to come from? Like, yeah. that's not going to get paid off. And I think that's going to continue to happen. <laughs> yeah. So I'm actually worried. I think more people should go to community college or your state school, Absolutely. save money. You don't need to go to NYU. You don't need right. to go to Harvard. I think that the paper on the wall is starting to lose its reputation. Yeah. Like the job that I just got, I came through an early, the company I got is hard to get into. It's number one place to work four out of the last five years. And you get paid a lot of money really early. Yeah. So I came through an early and career program. There was 40,000 applicants for that program and they picked 50 of us. Wow. And a lot of the people in there were smart. Like they had great degrees. They went yeah. to great colleges. I went to my regular college. I had a 3.4 GPA and a marketing degree, but I knew how to talk. I knew how to yeah. interview. I knew how to show value for myself that didn't rely on my education or my paper on the wall. Mm -hmm. And look where I'm at now. And I tell people that people are like, oh, I, you got lucky or like, right. oh, that's not going to happen to everybody. And I go, I get it's not going to happen to everybody, but there's 50 other companies that pay just as well as mine that you could go give a shot at. And you don't need to go have that Harvard degree to get into this. Right. I you could go and spend no money. So that that was that was that was a little bit of a tangent there. But yeah, you exited two companies by twenty two. I mean, yeah, freaking amazing. Trackify and Closeify. Closeify being to a friend of the pod, Luke, who I had yeah. on recently. What was that experience like, and what did you learn in that process? I learned a lot. Um, I learned that exiting a company is not nearly as easy as you think. Again, like young kid 21 i'm like oh like someone just sends you a check you hand stuff <laughs> over yeah. like not at all what it's like um i knew nothing about due diligence i knew nothing about all the different papers that you have to sign um and because that's originally i was talking to a lot of private equity firms mm -hmm. that we got a lot of interest from private equity the problem was they all want to do six months of due diligence yeah. and we're like we're not going to do six months of due diligence like it's a very straightforward yeah like business it's very straightforward like the deal we're looking for like we're not going to like play these games um so i learned a lot about that actual process which was very helpful for what i'm doing now um and building like a portfolio of software companies because now i'm like learning from all the mistakes that i had made right yeah. and um you know we're building the cell from day one and we're making sure that we don't repeat any mistakes so i definitely learned a lot about the acquisition um process and then i also just learned about like you know what you know, really affects your multiples of like what they actually care about. And a lot of it is like pretty self-explanatory, like churn is one of the most important metrics that they look at. Um, but another thing that I thought was really interesting is they, they care a lot about how many users you actually have. Yep. And it, it ties back to churn in the sense of like, if you have 200 clients that pay you a lot of money, that's cool. But it's like, if 10 people churn, that's a big percentage. Or if you have a thousand customers and 10 people churn, you don't care. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. I'm kind of thinking about what type of business model I go for next. Cause I'm like, I want to have one, a lot of users. Yeah. yeah. Let's give everybody listening a run through on what Closeify was, what Trackify was, get them to get an understanding yeah. on the businesses you built. So uh, Closeify was a hiring platform, hire commission only sales reps. Basically I was a freelance recruiter and I heard problems. They charge too much. They take too long and their, their reps for lack of better words are not that good. Um, and so I was like, how do I make it faster and more affordable? The answer is 
We still recruit the reps for them, but we don't interview and hire on their behalf. We let them do that via a self-serve hiring platform. Yeah. Built Closeify, that was how that started. And then with Trackify, so Trackify was a, a software to track your sales team's performance. So it's actually funny. I was talking to a bunch of our clients at Closeify. They're like, we hired these great sales reps from you. How do you set up their tracking? They were all using the, what everyone uses of like Google Forms um, as like an end of day report feeding into a Google Sheet. And they were like, it, like it works, but they're like, it's not like great. Like we wish we could do more with it. It was more robust. And so I literally just took their wish list of like, hey, what do you want? Like, what does Google Sheets not have that you want? I took their wish list, gave it to my dev. He built it on Bubble. Um, so it's just like some little cool things. Like there was like, you know, leaderboards with like automated like prizes and stuff. And this is probably stuff that you could have set up with Google Sheets um, if you just like made a bunch of like, you know, Zapier or make automations, but like it looked prettier. Um, and then, you know, we eventually built in CRM integrations. Um, so stuff like that. But yeah, it was a software to track your sales team's performance. Um, and so that was just built purely off of what a few of our like Closeify customers uh, were asking for. Cool. And I always like to, to, to challenge the guests. Like everybody loves to talk about the awesome things, like all the money that was. Yeah, of course. What were, what were some of the challenges? What were some of the, the tough times when you were going through? I mean, dude, 21, 20 building a software company yeah. like that. What are, what were some of the challenges? Yeah. I had a lot in 2022. Um, I talked about this on the last podcast that I went on. Um, so we were scaling really quickly. We were hitting like hockey stick growth. And, um, there's this guy that I'd known, like I'd known him for a while. I'd actually used one of his other software companies a while back. And so it was a guy that I had a good amount of trust in. And he was like, Hey, you need to like switch out your CRM. Like the one that you're using right now is not going to scale. You're scaling fast. Like, let's do this build for you. And so he's just like selling me on this like pipe bomb dream of like how good this build is going to be, how much more money it's going to make me, how much time it's going to save me. Just all these, all these promises. And, um, it was 15 grand for him to build it, which was like, I, I get it's a lot of money at the time for us. Like it wasn't, I was like, okay, yeah. sure. That's not bad. Um, what he didn't tell us is every software they subscribed us to, they put us on an annual contract that they didn't tell us it was for a year that we couldn't cancel and they get a commission from it. Oh, boy. So they like absolutely melt us for like commissions. Yeah. And then it all gets built out. It's not even better than what we had in the first place. And so we want to cancel it. And then we learned we can't, it's an annual subscription. And you know, we're like guys like this was like not good. Like, we need to do something to fix this. Like you either need to like partially refund us or like get these things canceled. And they were just like, and they were like, just like, th they're like, if you try to like charge back or anything, like we're going to sue you. And so like the softwares that they subscribed us to are three grand a month. So that's, you know, for the year that was 36 K 15 K to build. It was like a $50,000 L we didn't use anything they built for us. It was like a $50,000 mistake. Jeez. Um, yeah. I had another thing. I was 20 years old at the time. Very well-known entrepreneur was like, I want to like buy a piece of your company, had me fly out to his office. We had a meeting. We came to a deal. He was like, I'm not going to have you sign anything here today. I want you to feel comfortable. Go back home. We have our kickoff call. They're going to send the contract on Friday. Friday comes. They never send the contract. I follow up. I follow up. I follow up. Contract never comes. They ripped our IP. Dude. Yeah. Well, what, what were you feeling in those moments? Like, I mean, that, those are two massive L's yeah. that could be like, moments where you just decide to to close shop and move yeah. on like what what did that feel like yeah um <laughs> i would say the the one where i flew out sucked a little bit more because again they were just getting me so excited i was 20 bro and yeah. they were they were like they're whining and dining they were like we're gonna do millions this year like this is gonna make you rich yada 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 i was just super pumped and uh you know i, I learned my lesson about having legal in place and NDAs and non-competes before you disclose certain information, yep. uh, which is a good lesson for everyone listening. Um, <laughs> Always include a lawyer if you're yeah. listening and things are getting serious. Yeah. Losing the 50 grand, it wasn't necessarily the money that hurt me at that point because like it, it was whatever. It was more of like it was someone that I had a decent amount of trust in and um, for him to kind of like pull something like that. It was more of like the principle. I was like, that's pretty messed up. Yeah. And then to go as far as of like, Oh, like we're not going to do anything to try to make this right. Um, but I do believe that 
if you you know do bad business and you don't do good by people it's it's not up to me to get any sort of revenge it'll come back to them so uh you know you shake it off and you keep going yeah and i mean i think at the end of the day like in the moment it's it's a big deal yeah but, i mean you're on to much bigger and better things overall yeah those are just lessons you got to chalk up to the game yeah like i mean it, it is it's just things that now you're not going to make those mistakes when the when the arena is bigger those are mistakes you make early on that now when it's not a fifty thousand dollar l it's a five hundred thousand dollar yeah you're not going to make that mistake and that's like that's what's coming and it was cool because i was talking to my buddy with the cigars yeah and he just signed the biggest distributor in the southeast and his sales are about to 20x yeah so i'm like he's like dude I, you're not gonna see me for the next week like i gotta get my shit together like yeah. things are about to be much different the due diligence the tracking the yeah. numbers so it, it's important to make those mistakes early on unfortunately Absolutely. $50,000, that one hurts. And yeah. like getting your IP ripped, that one hurts. But that wasn't the turning point there. Like right. now when you have the big win, you're not going to make those mistakes when it starts to happen. We're talking here. You've said no coats ass a few times. I've been holding off on really getting yeah. into it. You're extremely bullish on no coats ass and you're actually yeah. building a personal brand around it. Yeah. I'll be the naive person in the room. <laughs> Explain no code SaaS to people who are listening and are like, what the hell is that? I don't. Yeah. And explain people might not even, we know what SaaS is, but yeah. people might not even know what that is. Yeah. So SaaS is software as a service, right? So think about Netflix. You're not paying any human for manual labor. You're paying for access to hosting, to watch your favorite shows and movies whenever you want, right? Like software is just fulfilling the service, right? Um, what no code is, is like, have you ever built a website, Shopify with Wix, Webflow? Yeah. Right. It's like drag and drop. Like you don't code websites anymore, or at least it would be pointless to do it. Yeah. Like if you, if, if you were like, Hey, like I'm going to build a website and you went and you fully coded it. People would be like, you're an idiot. <laughs> you could have done that in 15 minutes and would have looked better if you just used Webflow. Like people would actually think you're going to, you're an idiot. That is the direction that no code software is heading in pretty soon. If you actually fully code your software, people are going to be like, you are an idiot. Why did you just either pay so much money, spend so much time to build the same end product that you could have built in a fraction of the time, fraction of the cost with no code. So no code is a way to like drag and drop pre-coded, you know, blocks, templates to create web applications or even apps. Um, and, you know, I know there's going to be like someone that's going to like watch this and they're going to like say all the things that people normally say of like, oh, but can you build like a no code builder with no code? Like I, I get there's use cases for code still. Like, yeah, I get it. But most things can be built no code. Like you can build a lot no code, and especially like with live code now because of like the way that the technology is, you can build a lot. So I'm super bullish on the space. It is like, again, like kind of like how Shopify revolutionized e-commerce. Because again, it's like no longer are you coding your website. No longer do you need to like have like it's all centralized inside of Shopify. You have all your apps, like everything. And in five, 10 years from now, people are going to look back and they're going to be like, no code was the most obvious play of the century. Like you were going to feel like an idiot if you didn't bet on no code in five years, 10 years. Like I guarantee it. It is so obvious to me. Like that is like all my chips are in on the space. Yeah. So like if it flops and it fails, like by all means, clown me, clown me, whenever that happens, I'll, I'll take it on the chin. But like, in my opinion, this is the most obvious play ever. And like, I have all my chips in on this space. Dude. I mean, looking doing my homework i could tell you're all in i see the use cases i mean i have a tech background so i get it like yeah this is at the end of the day in simple terms it's scalable like it's just right. a scalable version you can now spin up 30 companies in 30 minutes with 30 different websites due to shopify and brands like that and no code so you have a dev agency mm -hmm. it's no code is there a little bit of coding on the back end for people listening? Like, is there still some type of coding? Like, can I just go and build a no code website right now? Is that how easy it is? Or do I still need a little bit of a technical up? So it, it completely depends like what you're building on. Like bubbles, technically low code. Um, it can be no code bubbles, almost like its own language. So there is a learning curve with it. Um, it would probably take you like two months to learn. Um, and you can like inject code into it if you need to. So that's like why it's so customizable. And that's why like my dev agency builds in bubble right now. But obviously now 
we build on live code. Mm-hmm. Um, if you go on softer, for example, though, anyone can figure out how to build on softer. Like it's, yeah. it's actually just like that easy. It's very drag and drop. And so then, yes, it's not going to be like as robust. It's not as customizable. Right. But um, if you just need to build an MVP and you're not a technical person, you're just like, let me build an MVP quickly, make a little bit of money and then either go pay someone or build on live code and then transfer to something else. Like that's a great route to go too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's platforms out there that like anyone can build on. And explain MVP because you said it a yeah. few times and I had to look it yeah. up. Yeah, it's you a mentioned it one time. minimum viable product. So it's just the first iteration of your software that you put out. And it's always, it's not going to be perfect, right? It's yeah. not supposed to be. It's the first iteration. It's just like, get it out. Yep. It's just important to get it out, get it out quick, validate it, iterate. Uh, it's the most important thing. So are you, are you a big advocate for launch, break shit, fix it, instead of spending six months trying to perfect the perfect thing? Yeah, you got to get to market quickly. And that's one of the big pros of note code is like, we're getting to market so much faster. Let's say like I get to market in four weeks using no code and someone fully codes theirs and it takes them six months to finish it. So I'm getting to market in a month. It's going to take you six months. By the time that I get to six months, I have gotten users, gotten feedback, iterated the product, made the product different, made the product better from it. I've ch- Maybe I've changed pricing models. I've done X, Y, Z multiple times by the six month mark yeah. and then they're just getting to market and they don't know the feedback that I've received. So now it's like, there's, there's playing catch up. And then it's like, honestly, like even if they did have a better product, if I'm a good marketer, which I am, it's like, I'm running laps around you. You know what I mean? Cause like you're taking too long. Um, you do have to be careful. Like for me now that I have like a decent sized audience that like, I can't like, if I put out an MVP, I have to like make a, a very close beta I can't just like put it up on my story and say, hey, yo, go crazy. Because if I put like a thousand people on a software and it just breaks a bunch, like that's not good. Yeah. Like it's just not a good look for the company, obviously. So I have to like literally like let people in like one by one and like work very closely with them. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm a big advocate for getting to market quickly, validating it, iterating and continuing to improve your product. Yeah, I think it's funny. Twitter, I, I love Twitter X, whatever the hell you want to yeah. call it now. Um, and I, I saw a tweet recently that was great. It's like entrepreneurs on their first time are obsessed with product. Yep. Entrepreneurs on their second time are obsessed with distribution. Yep. The product doesn't have to be amazing. It's whoever can get the most eyeballs on it is yep. really who's going to win. Because if you have a product that's 20 times better than mine, but I have 20, 20 times more users, yep. I'm still going to beat you. Yep. And I think people don't understand that till it really happens to them. So I completely agree with you on like the yep. throw it out there, break it fix it, continue to iterate because no pro I don't care if you work six months on the perfect product, you're going to launch in and there's going to be complaints. People are going to get feedback yep. and then you're just into the same space that you are in fixing it, adding things, but I'm launching it and dealing with that while well, you've already launched, fixed it, dealt with that. And now you're way ahead of me. So yep. I think it's great. And it's, it's such a good point there. And because this change is like in the middle of happening and not everyone is fully realizing it. So I want to like give the people that are listening some like actual game around it. And this is also like a myth about no code is they're like, there's no tech mode. Yeah. And I'm like, so like, let's say it costs $10,000 to build it on no code and costs $50,000 to build it on, on native code, $40,000 difference. If someone wants to copy you, if they're successful, if they're wealthy, $40,000 doesn't mean anything to them. They're still going to copy you. There's no tech mode anymore unless you spend millions on development. And you you actually have something that is difficult to replicate, right? Now the moat is around distribution. It is around eyeballs. And that is why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's why that's why I'm here. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like that that's the honest truth is everything that I do, it's not that I do enjoy doing this. I do enjoy like speaking to people and meeting cool people. But the reason I put out content is because I need to own as many like, you know, media assets as possible. Um, yep. Because that's just like, and this shift is happening like in real time, but people tend to like, they, they don't ever pick up on it until it's too late. And so that's why you see these big companies that are now hiring creators on six figure salaries. Yeah. That's why you see companies, billion dollar companies that are sponsoring YouTube channels now. You know, they understand they need to find a way to own more ad, you know, ad, uh, media assets. That's why you see HubSpot is buying newsletters. That's why they're buying podcasts. Mm-hmm. They know they need to own these audiences. Uh, and so that is like a shift that's happening in real time that a lot of people are missing the mark on and they're going to kick themselves when they actually realize it and it's too late. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And congrats on that HubSpot sponsorship. That's Appreciate that's it. awesome and, and really cool. And 
I wrote down here that you said a personal brand is just not going to be enough anymore. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about your come up story. We've talked about your exiting of businesses, the creation of businesses, your new idea. And I wanted to funnel that all into your personal brand, which is now priority number one, it seems like. Yep. And there's a cool story that you've told and it's, I, I summed it up this way. You turned three free, you turned three free clips in a 20,000 followers, a personal brand and a friend. Yep. Tell that story to people listening. Yeah. So, um, it's actually funny. He's a really good friend of mine now, Presley, not, unfortunately not Cam that we have here. <laughs> um, I, I do love Cam though. Um, and he was this 19 year old kid that he did like one month of college and then he dropped out. Um, from a really good school and he was moving to Miami. You know, I moved at 20 to Miami, not knowing too many people. And so I was like, yeah, this is a 19 year old kid. I was just like trying to be nice. We had connected on, on Twitter and I was like, Hey, like, let's go get lunch. So like we go out to lunch and like I take him on a boat and, um, he was like, let's do a podcast and like, keep in mind, I didn't really do podcasts at this time. I had no yeah. brand. Like, you know what I mean? Um, and I was like down to do it. I was like, why not? Like he's a nice kid. And uh, I do the podcast and he's like, do you want three free clips? And I was like, he has a short form content agency, um, which they're not even really that. They're more of like a full stack creative team. Um, but I was like, sure. Sure. The very first clip that I post goes viral. And again, I didn't plan this. Like I didn't script this video out. I didn't have any like framework in my head of like, oh, here's how to like have a viral. Like I was just like, I just sat down. And I just like said the first thing that came to my mind. Like it was like completely random. The fact that it blew up. Yeah. Um, and like you said, I was like, I guess we're like working together now. Cause like <laughs> all these people were like DMing me. They're like, we've never seen someone convert so many followers from one video. Again, just like then viral video, viral video, viral video, zero to hundred K followers in 95 days. Yeah, no, I have that right here. I was about to say 95 days to hundred K followers. I'm on like 95 days to 130 followers. Yeah. So maybe off camera, we need to talk yeah. about maybe what I need to do differently. Cause yeah. I'm missing a few zeros on mine. Yeah. But I mean, dude, what did that feel like? I mean, 100,000 followers is huge. Like you went from somebody who's uber successful at a young age, but kind of behind closed doors in a way, yeah. not huge online yeah. to, I mean, dude, 100,000 followers, you you demand some respect now when you walk into a room from a creator standpoint. Yeah. It, it's honestly just like so funny too. Cause like, I just like, I honestly like forget. <laughs> um, and it's not until like, I literally like, I probably get recognized like almost once a day now in Miami. Dude, that's awesome. And it's just like so funny. Cause every time I'm just like walking and someone will like say like Alex or like no code Alex or like fist bump me in the street. I'm just like, always think it's so funny. Um, but, um, the coolest part about it is the fact that it can get me into rooms that just my accolades alone couldn't get me into. Yep. Cause like I have, I had like decent accolades, but it was like, there's, there's just like levels to it. Right. And so it got to a point where there's this dude that he sold a software company for 110 million and he was trying to put out content around, next. around his experience. And he was like, he reached out to me and he was like, dude, I sold my software company for 110 million, but I can't get more than like 500 views on a video. Like, what am I doing wrong? And so all of a sudden I have a guy that sold his company for nine figures was like asking for a call with me because like, I'm just good at content yeah. and I like figured it out. Um, and so it's like, I, I've expanded my network a lot through, which is probably like one of the biggest advantages of it. Um, it's just gotten me into a lot of rooms and, you know, gotten me to meet a lot of cool people that are now going to help me on all the ventures that I'm doing now that we talked about. Um, but I mean, yeah, honestly, I, I forget about it most of the time because it's just like so funny. Cause like, I, I think it's so funny because people, um, like just assume that you might be this one type of person or I'm like, I'm like the most like regular, like 22 year old kid ever. Like something funny for me. If you like, I still like play Fortnite with my friends, like yeah. at home, like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just like a very, like, I like to play tennis. I like to play pickleball. Like I like to go to the gym and I w go on walks. Like I'm a very like normal, like 22 year old kid. I don't do like anything that's like out of the ordinary. And people like tend to think that I have like some sort of like interesting life. I'm like, <laughs> not really, not really. I mean, I'm sure it's interesting to some people. Yeah, definitely of, a lot of, of people from your hometown in of Ohio course. to what it is now. Of course. But I, I just think the cool thing is, I mean, and it kind of puts a bow on what we were talking about before. Distribution is everything. Eyeballs is everything. Mm -hmm. You now own your own distribution in a way. Yeah. And you're going to get into these rooms because, yeah, I'm sure people like Alex and want to talk about your success, but they also selfishly know that 
there's a hundred thousand people following you behind that they can't yeah. see, but they know that are there. Yeah. So like, how important is a personal brand right now? Is that like priority number one? Because that's what's going to give you the ability to tap into a large distribution market at the snap of fingers? Yeah. Um, I think it's almost like a necessity for any online business owner. Because keep in mind, it's like, even if you're doing cold email, which are, I'm still a huge proponent for outbound, cold email, LinkedIn outbound, all things you should be doing, assuming you have a B2B business. Um, first thing someone does when you reach out to them most often is they look up you or your company mm -hmm. so if you're a ghost on the internet you don't really exist yeah it's like they're not gonna respond they're like who's who's this rando like messaging me like i'm not gonna respond but if they look you up and they're like oh wow he's been on some big podcasts he's got a lot of testimonials like he puts out some really valuable youtube videos some really valuable reels they're gonna respond yeah like it, it's like think about if like a, a celebrity like dm'd you like you're gonna respond um, and so you can almost become like a business celebrity and it's just like, people are just going to respond when you reach out to them. Um, and on top of that, it's like, you just become the authority of your space. Yep. Like it's so important to be seen as an authority. And the only way that you can do that is by putting out content that demonstrates you actually know what you, you're talking about and you actually know what you're talking about by doing it. So there is like a problem of people that are trying to like fake it, right. Of people that are trying to like, they're almost trying to be content creators before they're ever business people. Yep. Right. It was like, I was a business person first. And then I just started putting out content about things that I've done and I, and people found it interesting. Um, but I think that's not going to work. You can't be a content creator first and then just try to like, if you're going to try to be a content creator first, you have to literally be a content creator. Like yeah. that has to be your number one focus of like getting really good at making content. You're better off doing it for a brand that needs a content creator. Um, but um, kind of like what I was saying, I don't think a personal brand is going to be enough though soon. We've talked about everything up until right now. I want to end it with talking about what's next in the next three years. You're really into venture capital. Your goal is to really start acquiring a lot of companies and build a portfolio of businesses. Where does that come from? And what's your plan to execute on that? Yeah, so it is interesting to think about like like the next two, three years, like my focus is I've got Fine Tuner, which is my other software company. Um I'm launching a, a call center for software companies, which is going to be really lucrative. Um, after that, I do want to get into the venture capital space or, you know, maybe just angel investing. I don't fully know. You know, it always changes. Um, I know I want to stay in business, but I know I don't want to be a CEO again. Um, and just really trying to like, again, just less about like my, what accomplishments I'll go for after that, but trying to become just a, overall better entrepreneur because that's the one thing that i'll say is like i'm trying to do differently is like i, I want to be like a good entrepreneur mm -hmm. and i know that sounds like basic but i think most people now are just internet hustlers um and i got this from a business partner of mine luke and he said the same thing that's why he stepped away i mean he was doing millions of dollars a year like actually like legit and he shut it all down to buy pudgy penguins and to go for billions yeah because he was like i want to be a real entrepreneur that like leaves a legacy. Kind of like what I said about like being like that guy. Like he wants to be like that guy. Yeah. Like he doesn't want to just be like another internet hustler, which is like what most people are. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But it's like, and maybe it's just like my ego, but I don't want to be an internet hustler. So I just want to be the guy that becomes a really good entrepreneur and like a true entrepreneur that builds really cool businesses that leaves somewhat of a legacy that, you know, I can like look back and say like, I was, I was in a league with all the other people that they look up to and study. Um, and how I'm going to execute is I'm just going to, like I said, I'm just going to keep getting better at what I think I'm best at. I don't think it makes sense for me to like go learn and try to learn operations. So I'm going to try to become like a really good marketer. I'm going to try to be really good at sales. I'm going to try to get even better, understand human psychology. I'm going to try to get even better at identifying trends. I think, I think identifying trends is one of the biggest skills people can have actually. And I think I've kind of, I've done well with it, but again, you can always be better. Um, but honestly, I don't even know. Like, you know, I might find in, in three years, I reach my, one of my goals of like having escape velocity of like, you know, not really having to work if I don't have to. And like, I might go play tennis again. Like I might go to just try to play futures. And even though I'll lose money, like go play professional tennis and lose money. Like I have yeah. no idea. Um, so yeah, I don't really know where I'll be in three years, but um, I'm not really worried about it. 
Dude, I'm, I'm really excited for you in the next three years. Now I'm happy we were able to make this connection. And I feel like I got in early. Like yeah. <laughs> I'll be able to watch you really blow this thing up. And yeah. I plan on having you on the show multiple more times so that you can go through and, and talk about this. Because I think you've given everybody listening and watching a ton of value for free here. Like, I mean, I'm starting a new thing. It's not free. You got to subscribe. <laughs> so that's the way you pay me back for bringing people like you on the show and and people that stuck around and are still listening and watching. Yeah. Like these last 15 minutes have been, I think the real gold yeah. of this episode where you gave people free game that they can go and start to make money right now off the, yeah. after this is over, once they're done watching. So dude, I mean, you've absolutely crushed it. Where can people find you and interact with you? What platforms are you most active? All of it's going to be linked below. Your newsletter is going to be linked below. I want people to be able to connect with you and, and watch this journey. Yeah, the Instagrams uh, at no code Alex. Uh, my YouTube. I also don't know what my handle is, but if you search Alex Heidner, if you search no code Alex, you'll find It'll me. Yeah, you'll find me. Um, those are the main two that I'm most active on, and then yeah, newsletter. So I appreciate you. This was awesome. For sure, dude. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been yeah. an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thank you.